Welcome to Global Minnesota Podcast, connecting, informing, and engaging Minnesotans with the world and exploring important international issues. For a complete list of programs and to join us, visit globalminnesota.org. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, and you've certainly given us a lot to think about. And uh, uh, many, many different, different points. I, I was writing down notes. Um, I think you know this idea of Russia as a young country uh -huh. is kind of an interesting thing because I think a lot of us tend to think, um, yeah, 1991, um, the Russian Federation was created, and it was a young country, and there was this big hole, and you know, the rest of the world and in Russia, um, that you know, in terms of corner, it was no longer going to be the Soviet Union, it was no longer going to be this command economy, centrally controlled, um, but then over the years, and particularly through the Putin time, there's been this kind of return to the central, central top-down um, command and uh, economy to a certain extent, but mm -hmm. certainly politics. And we tend to think of it as reverting back to either you know, the, the communist period or to even before that, the Russian Empire, the strong autocratic. <coughs> so it's kind of interesting to hear you describe it as a new country despite all these views of Putin. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, Putin, certainly, if you were to ask him, he would talk about Russia as an ancient country. Actually, Russia, thousand years old, you know, accepted Christianity in the 900s. You know, it is, it is a thousand years old, actually, as, as kind of a, you know, an entity. But it is a modern country, because it is not the Soviet Union. Um, it is Russia. It's modern Russia. And it is still trying to um, pull together different systems. And I think if you look at the early Yeltsin days, there was a lot of very, very rapid change. I mean, Yeltsin said to the regions, you know, well, let's, let's take it back. Let's take it to the Soviet Union. You have this enormous country that spread from let's say, you know, Ukraine, to right up to the border of Eastern Europe, and then spread 11 time zones, and it still is 11 time zones, although they, they put it back to nine, but I think we're back to 11 time zones. Anyway, 11 time zones, all the way out to the Pacific. So it's an enormous country. And I think it's really important to remember the psychological trauma that happened when the, it collapsed all of those countries that were on the periphery and also in Central Asia became independent countries. So there is that, that um, you know, Putin has referred to that as the greatest geopolitical tragedy, uh, you know, of, of modern times. So that's not an exact quote, but he, what he believed was that this country had been essentially, the Soviet Union, ripped apart. And Russians were left, ethnic Russians, were left in other countries. That's the way he looks at it. And so he, as he looks at this, he, this is not exactly answering your question, but I think psychologically it's important, that he believes that as the United States had uh, the Monroe Doctrine in the 1800s, that Russia has kind of a privileged area in these countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union, especially in Ukraine. You know, there's Ukraine, Belarus, places that were very ethnically, you know, connected to Russia, and they still think that it's kind of their neighbor. So it's a modern country, but it still thinks of the Soviet Union. And for young people, like 17-year-olds, they think of Russia as a, as a big country, even though it is smaller than it used to be, but geographically it's big. And it always had enormous um, heft ever since, well, easily in the 1800s, but you could go back to the 1700s, where it had, it was a major player, major player in the world since Peter the Great, let's say. So it, they're young, but they think old. <laughs> and so that, that plays a role. And then the institutions that existed, you know, think of all of the, I think of, um, let's say, in the Soviet Union, as a person's body that all of a sudden the uh, back room falls out. 
you know, what's left. The Communist Party, the structure of the, of the Communist Party, really created society. It was people who were, lived, were educated, got health care, et cetera, and had their ideology from the Communist Party. That's suddenly over, 1991, and what's left, those, let's call them civic structures, had to be rebuilt. And during Yeltsin, it was quite chaotic. It began. But then Putin comes in and sees this chaos and says, you know, I'm going to straighten this out. And so he begins to pull in the reins. This is very simplistic, but it's really true. He begins to pull in the reins and control things. And so he has a power vertical, which he believes is saving Russia from disintegration again. He believes that that is a value to save it from chaos. Whereas we look at it as control. But there is a narrative. I think there's a narrative coming from China and from Russia, which says, look at the chaos in the United States right now. Look at the political chaos. Look at the inability of Congress to pass any laws. Look at their social chaos, you know, racial disparity, economic disparity. Um, you know, shooting young black men, etc. They just look at this and they say, is that what you want? Is, it, is this the democracy that you want? Putin is very disparaging about that image of democracy. So it's, it's not as easy to say, you know, young, old, democratic, not. It, it, I really believe that a lot of this is lived in the memories and the minds of people. People who grew up in the Soviet Union, part of it's still in them. That's the And the young people who know nothing about Putin have a different approach. That's why I think the young people are very interested. And one thing I would add is that Madeleine Albright you know, talks about how after the breakup of the Soviet Union, she was doing focus groups in various mm -hmm. cities. And she remembers a group in Russia where um, the, the cold man stood up and he said, I am so ashamed. Um, we used to be a great power, and now we're Bangladesh with nuclear weapons. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so, I mean, that pride. Yes. Uh, is, pride is very important. It's gone. And that's why I think when we call Putin a thug, it is, number one, we just shouldn't do it because we shouldn't call other leaders thugs. I think. It's just, it doesn't, it's not useful. Really, unless maybe they're murdering their, well, that's where we start. But I mean, I've been, in, I've been in countries where they boil the opposition in oil. So my, you know, my, let's say, my rules of being a thug are very low. But I do think it's counterproductive to call me a thug. Um, so we have some questions here. Um, one that kind of goes on from the question that, that I asked, which talks about, you know, you call Russia a new country. Uh, do you see a change in values between the former regime that being the USSR and you know, Russia and Putin today? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Now, values, I mean, we have to define what we mean by values. I would say ideology, you know, the communist ideology goes back, of course, to Marx and Lenin, Marx and Engels, and then to Lenin, which was, you know, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. Capitalism is rampant. We, you know, it will eventually lead to the destruction of the working class. We have to bring down capital. It was a very worked out ideology and very, in a sense, scientific. And that is what they based it on, their entire structure. And that is also what they proselytized around the world. And it found a lot of reception in developing countries. Uh, I remember when I was studying, I studied when I was uh, I, not 19, I just turned 20, and I studied in Leningrad at the time at Leningrad State University. And there were a lot of uh, students from other countries, including Africa. And that ideology, you know, that communist ideology, was actually very attractive. They were coming out of colonialism. They felt that capitalism uh, was a, a malign influence in their countries. And this is I mean, that's a pretty attractive idea. Now, there is no real ideology. There is capitalism, there is business, there is, uh, I guess you could call it, um, kind of an approach 
to society. And Putin is trying to put together, I would not call it quite an ideology, but I think it's almost there, which is, um, let me think how I describe this. Russia is a great country, always has been, always will be. Deserves a role in the world. It is a country with an enormous civilization and culture. Uh, it should be respected in the world. Um, and Russia, and this is an interesting part of it, is a moral force in the world. And what they mean by that is Europe is corrupt. Europe is morally debauched. The United States is right behind. And this is all in quotes, but gay rights, etc. cetera, you know, this is moral depravity. And Russia is the um, moral force in the world, a pure country that um, can be a beacon. Um, this is used politically by the Kremlin. It also has resonance in countries, Africa, some in Asia, who do look upon you know, um, modern, let's say, diverse modern European and American society as debauched and uh, decadent. And so that works too, but it doesn't quite work in Moscow, where there are a whole lot of people who are just like people here, it's kind of like being in New York, and there are a lot of people who do not accept that ideology at all. So it's a work in progress. So following on this question about ideology and values, um, there are a, a few questions here that kind of ask about Putin's intentions. Mm -hmm. So do you think that he has the long-term interests of Russia in mind over his own power and that of his oligarch, oligarchs? Um, and then it goes on as past assassinations in England, uh, inter you know, interfering in the U.S. elections, uh, things like this. Yeah. Uh, but that is so always the question about whether whether he is thinking long term or he's just thinking about his own power. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm intrigued about that first part about um, is he in it for himself or for Russia? Um, I think on one level, Putin comes from Leningrad. And having spent quite a bit of time in Leningrad, I studied there for almost a year, to, twice. It was kind of broken up, but a couple of about a year. And we lived in a dorm, and a lot of times we didn't have hot water. And it was pretty authentic. I had a lot of Russian friends, and it was pretty authentic for a foreigner. It was a pretty authentic experience. Um, I think that Putin, as a Russian, does not want Russia to suffer the way he has suffered. I think that he remembers, you know, his father was shot up at the front during World War II. His mother almost died of starvation. What would have been his older brother, if he were still alive, uh, died probably of dysentery, nobody really knows, and is buried in a massive common grave in Leningrad, now St. Petersburg. So this is a personal history. And I think Vladimir Putin does not want that. Remember the siege of Leningrad. This is why that all happened. Siege of Leningrad, um, in which practically a million people starved to death or died at various reasons. So he doesn't want that to happen again. And I think he is also never again uh, for the country to be invaded or um, demeaned by other countries. That said, Putin is the head of a structure which uh, in, it has a lot of, you know, controls the country, and controls the country economically and politically. And there's a high level of corruption. And so where his interests, you know, begin, and the nations begin, is very, very hard to define. I mean, he thinks that he is good for the country. He thinks that his rule, which is you know, pretty straight ahead, this vertical, power vertical, is good for Russia. Now, he benefits from it, and so do the guys who are the oligarchs who are you know, working with him and in bed with him in controlling the economy. And that's where you get, you know, is it good for Russia? I personally do not think that is good for Russia, obviously. <coughs> You know, corruption, high level of corruption, controlled by one controlling group that will not trust a 
an average person to start his own business, who would shake him down. That is not good for Russia. But this is a debate. I mean, I think every time I think of Russia nowadays, I think of China. Because China also has an approach that you need a very strong government. And you need control in order to move ahead. And so I don't agree with this. But there are some people who would say, look, this is the price of doing business. You know, you have to run the country and you have to be kind of ruthless sometimes. And that's just the way it is. I don't agree with it. But that's many people. So there are a number of questions to ask about the oligarchs and the role of the oligarchs. <laughs> Our favorite <laughs> the economy and whether it's possible to modernize, um, given their whole hold on on the economy. And there's a related question: um, Has Putin committed crimes to gain hold on power to such a scale that he can never leave power without fear of consequences? Will he never leave? Well, I mean, he's going to die. So, <laughs> like all of us, he will pass on. Um, I think that right now he's not going to say, here's my, like Boris Yeltsin, he's not going to be like Yeltsin to say, here's the guy that I want to take over when I'm Because he has six years to rule, so he would be a lame duck and that would be crazy. Um, so he keeps people guessing about who would be in charge. He has, however, brought in a cadre of quite smart technocrats, moving them into the government, um, in positions kind of out in the provinces and different places. They're all like 30-somethings, and, and they're actually quite impressive. So he's doing that. But will he ever leave? I think it, uh, at this point, he feels that he can't. I think he feels that uh, the enemies of Russia would take advantage, and he has to keep the, get his hand on the tiller as long as possible. Um, will now are there? Has he done such terrible things that, that he would be? What was it kind of you know uh, arrested or something like that? Has Putin committed crimes to gain hold uh, to, to gain a hold on power to such a scale that he can never leave power without fear of? what those consequences would be. Would, would he be overthrown? Certainly he worries about that. Certainly he thinks that the United States would love to do that. I think he actually is believe that. That the United States would like to overthrow him, uh, or at least weaken his rule. So he's worried about that. Um, has he committed so many crimes? You know, I think you would have to say that there are there have been a string of people who died internationally who the evidence seems to point that there was a, there was government interference, specifically the KGB or the GRU, which is kind of military uh, <coughs> That certainly these people have just died by accident. Now, does, does Putin say kill him? I don't think Putin has to. Um, I think that if they become a threat, to the system, then the system itself begins to take action to control these people. Um, I, I don't see, other than corruption, corruption I think is a more serious thing, but could we ever find out uh, even how much money Putin has? You know, many people say that he is the richest man in the world, but nobody knows. Uh, there are estimates that he has $200 billion stashed away someplace. He may be the richest man in the world, but nobody knows. Nobody can prove it. And, you know, at that point, if you've got $1 billion or you've got $200 billion, I don't think it makes so much difference. It's really power in what you do with it. So, no, I don't think he was going to leave willingly um, soon, but I think eventually, if you use six years from now, he'll be 70. Um, he's vigorous, you know, but he technically has outlived the lifespan of an average Russian man. So would he want to step aside? Maybe, maybe. I don't know. It's very hard to say. Six years in Russia is really like, it's kind of like dog years. You know? and really, six years, one year in Russia, you're exhausted. A lot happens in one year in Russia. So six years from now, I don't know. Mm. Um, uh, thank you for that. There are other questions about what the 
what was Putin's role in the U.S. elections? Oh, boy. That's my least favorite subject because I don't totally know. Um, Mr. Mueller obviously does, and eventually he'll come out with his report. I will say, a person asked me at noon about that, and I'll give you just a shorthand of what I think happened. Um, going back to the Soviet days, and Margaret, you know this quite well, the Soviet Union was interfering in our political system way back, you know, in the 1960s, even the 50s. It was doing this always under the Soviet Union, under the communist they were trying to exploit divisions in society and use them to their advantage. So you had, back in, like, when I was a student, you had certain student organizations that were funded by the Soviet Union that would have uh, protest demonstrations, you know, pay to have these organizations have protests on the streets, and it looked like they were Americans. Does this sound familiar? But they actually weren't. They were, at one point, it was anti-nuclear um, weapons in Europe, when the United States was putting nuclear weapons in Europe. And the peaceniks, if you remember that from that period. So this has happened for a long time. That, I think, is part of what the Russians were doing. It's what they always have done, going back 50 years, okay? Then you have let's call it the KGB spy part of it, which is the KGB wants to get information on what is going on in the United States and hopefully kind of stir up a few things along the way. So they were uh, involved, and I have very little doubt about this, involved in stealing uh, the uh, emails of the DNC. Uh, I do think that WikiLeaks is, there's no question in my mind that Julian Assange is part of the system. Maybe a long time ago when he started out, he wasn't, but there's no question to my mind that he's involved in this by revealing those emails in a very highly choreographed, timed, right at the beginning of the Democratic National Congress in Philadelphia. Yeah. So there was that. Then there was, I would call it the PR side. That would be RT television, the Russian media, etc., which were, yet at one point, this would be cranking up the propaganda machinery, which has existed. Initially, I do believe, I do ascribe to the theory that this to harm Hillary Putin. <laughs> Hillary Clinton. Um, who, uh, Putin has no love lost for Hillary Clinton because he believes that she is a very tough broad who is going to make his life miserable should she become president. But then more seriously, that she would probably that she was involved in stirring up protests against the Russian government <coughs> against Putin in, in 2012. 2012. Yeah. And he believes that she was trying to incite and foment revolution, color revolutions, kind of like a la what happened in Georgia and Ukraine. Blames her for that. This could be some payback. And what they wanted to do, this is my theory, but from everything that I know, was they wanted to wound her, uh, damage her, so that when she got into the presidency, which they expected would happen, she would be kind of, uh, she'd have a lot of baggage. Um, she would be depicted as a uh, feeble old lady on the verge of death. A lot of Russian propaganda during the election was, she's sick, she's old, she's gonna die. Um, and remember when Hillary fell, there was a moment when she fell, that was absolutely used by Russian propaganda, played over and over and over again to say that she is about to die. I'll give you one example. No, I don't want to go on, but this is a very good example because I do follow propaganda. It's one of the areas that I do, you know, I try to have some expertise. So there was a video of Hillary on the plane where she was talking to reporters, and somebody asked her something, and she wanted to say, kind of like, oh my goodness, who knows? So a lot of us kind of go, who knows? So she did that, and she did it in kind of a funny way. She went like this. So that video was taken, and then it was turned into kind of a gif. It was repeated. So the video came out as, and anyone who's on social media knows this, she was going like this. <laughs> So, I, I mean, she looked crazy. 
And that was used by the Russian media and then came swirling around the world back to very ultra-conservative groups that were playing that and saying, Hillary Clinton is crazy. She's losing it. She's feeble. So that, that's the type of propaganda. It, because of the internet, which weaponized and then, um, let's say, put a you know, power tool to it, this was, this was something that didn't exist in the old Soviet days. But many of the things that they were doing were kind of old <coughs> Soviet approaches, but they were turbocharged by the internet, and by social media. So I think, you know, if you kind of, going back again, we have the old techniques, the military side, the propaganda side, which was in, enabled by people like Julian Assange, and then the Kremlin PR cranking up. And then the last thing, were they trying to help Donald Trump? I do believe that they were trying to help Donald Trump because I looked at the coverage every day. I was in Russia a lot of that period, and I also was in Estonia, a place that I go to a lot uh, for conferences. And I, I worked there, did some research. Um, they were definitely praising Trump, making him look like a very good candidate. And, and in fairness, they wanted that because they thought that Trump would improve relations. I mean, it makes sense that they would like Trump because Trump said, can't we be friends with Russia? So I'm trying to get kind of a benign interpretation to this. There's a more malign interpretation. But I definitely think that they, to a certain extent, were trying to help Donald Trump. So all of that put together is, I think, what happened. The collusion part is what is not correct. Did the Trump campaign, did President Trump or his people actually actively work or cooperate with the Russians to do that? And that's the missing link. I do not know, and I think that's what Mueller is looking at. So that's a shorthand, but. <laughs> um, now, let's change gears completely and go into some foreign relations. Mm -hmm. um, what does Russia think of China? A huge population, a very long border, modernizing rapidly, making more progress than Russia. Yes. So, how, what, what are the, what's the state of Russia's relationship with China? Does Russia want to emulate China? You know, but it's a really excellent question. I think it's key. I think Russia looks at China, they know very objectively that China is moving ahead. China is the power to be reckoned with um, in every way possible, economically, development, tech, etc. Um, in recent years, and I'm thinking from Ukraine, the incursion into Ukraine, 2014, when the West turned against Russia and began uh, instituting sanctions, Russia turned to China even more and depicted them as kind of allies. And they turned, and I also was in Moscow at this period, where they said, we don't need the West anymore because we have this ally, China. It was even a period at that point where credit cards, some of the major credit card companies were not working with Russia because of the sanctions. It was a real period where MasterCard, Visa, et cetera, went on doing it. And the, and the Russians were actually saying, don't worry, we can use Chinese credit cards. That didn't last very long. But they actually were saying that. So I think they think of themselves as suppliers of energy. You know, it's a lucrative market for them. They try to bargain with the Chinese. I think the Chinese are better bargainers on this. Um, but rhetorically, they look at China as an ally. And it's usually in the context of, we'll show the West, won't we? It's kind of the undercurrent of that friendship. On the other hand, I think that they fear that China is much more economically powerful and really militarily powerful too. I mean, look at what China is doing right now. So I think there's quite a bit of fear that they might be left behind. I just wrote, I was mentioning this today, I just finished writing an article for the Wilson Quarterly, which is a publication of the Wilson Center on artificial intelligence. It's a whole takeout they will have in May on AI. And I did an article on 
AI and Russia. And um, it's being edited right now. And you can see, you know, China spends a lot of money on that. So does the United States. And Russia is trying to, but this kind of top-down approach is kind of bedeviling them in that too, because they they want the government and let's say the military to develop it top down. And there I think that's it's going to do something. I mean, they have some very interesting weapons, but ultimately, if you want AI, has uh, you know, do, it's dual use. It's commercial and it's military, and the commercial is where they fail because they can't seem to commercialize their intellectual knowledge. They're very good theoretically, but not very good at creating companies from it. So, um, yeah, China, I think, is. China, for all of us, will be the factor. Um, How about the United States? Does Russia want better relations with the United States? You know, that is an excellent question. It's not a simple question. I think the Russian people do want better relations with the United States. There's no question. Um, they want their kids to be able to travel, maybe even study here. Um, they look at the United States as a place of innovation and, you know, companies and where you can do well, et cetera. But there's also a little chip on the shoulder because we do throw our weight around. And that's why you have those comments by Putin talking about egotistical countries and egotistical thinking and exceptionalism. He didn't say American exceptionalism. He said that today. He didn't say American exceptionalism, but that's what he meant. So at the same time that Russians, um, I think, kind of respect the United States for our ability to get things done, there's a chip on the shoulder because we are the big guys in the neighborhood, the clods who run around, um, kind of like the bull in the China shop, ruining countries, especially in the Middle East. Yeah, that is the way they look at it. Now, what does Putin want? That's what I am in a, in a group, oddly enough, that will be meeting in Washington tomorrow. I will fly there tomorrow morning, and we begin our meetings. And this is a group that is trying to stand back. It's what you call a track two group, or, you know, some, not um, like first rank diplomacy, it's a track two. It's like civilians and former uh, military, military, state department, academics, et cetera. And what we're looking at is, why do we care about Russia? Things have gotten so bad. Maybe we just kind of re-evaluate. Let's start from scratch. So why do we care about Russia? What are our interests, the United States' interests, and do they coincide with Russia's or not? And what we're trying to do is not take the usual approaches. Golly, can't we just get along? Isn't there something we can do? Um, yeah. So what? So what we're trying to do is stand back and say, what are we trying to do in the United States as a nation? And where does that intersect with Russia? And are there things that we can work on? Are there other things we may have to just kind of look at Russia as a force that is not going to go along with the, um, intellect, the uh, international system the way it is? Which the Russians would argue, post-Cold War, uh, approach to security is essentially defined by the United States, and they're not going to go along with that. So where does that leave us? You know, we have, we have a different approach to the, the security system in Europe, especially in Europe, let alone around the world. So I think the, the verdict is out. I don't think they want a war. I do not think they want a war, and I don't think they actually want any type of military or anything like that, because we have too many nukes. This is very, very serious. But I think they want to challenge our leadership. <coughs> challenge our leadership. So there's a, a perennial question about who lost Russia in the United States. Yes. And just yesterday, there's a piece of the New York Times that's arguing mm -hmm. that the Russia experts in the, the U.S. administration are going back for number of years, State Department, National Security Council, 
um, had this very confrontational approach to Russia, spreading democracy, and, uh, um, and essentially it's their fault that we're in the situation that we're in now with such poor the relations. The 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 yeah. right. So my <laughs> question is, um, do you believe that, in fact, we are the cause of the, relation, the, the state of the, of the relations? And, um, in fact, does Russia want to that? Was Russia ours to lose? That is a question that every time I go to a conference on Russia, mm -hmm. that's the question. I mean, it's like, who wrote, you know, whose fault is it? And they're in this table. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I do not think it was those experts. That is too simplistic. I mean, it's, it may be a nice subject for an article, right. and I don't really know it. It doesn't capture it. I, you know, if there was any fault, here's what I'd say. You had the you know, Soviet Union collapses, and at that point, NATO exists, the Warsaw Pact no longer exists, and you have the question of security at that point in Europe. It was really before ISIS and before, you know, like terrorism. It was not really on the agenda at that point. So what didn't happen, and I blame both sides for this, is that we did not bring, and maybe I blame the West a little bit more, but we did not think out of the box to include Russia, very specifically, how do you include Russia in the security structure of Europe and the United States after the war, after the Cold War? Um, we invited, or at least we said, Russia would be welcome in NATO. Mr. Putin actually said at one point, maybe Russia could be part of NATO. But that was kind of short-lived. And I think that, you know, Putin really feels that he was ignored um, by the West and demeaned by the West. And also, remember, he was coming from the big, bad Soviet Union, which is a very massive power in the world. The whole world had been defined by the Soviet Union and the United States. And then all of a sudden, that doesn't happen. The mentality of Russia was still, we still are the Soviet Union. We deserve to be here. We deserve a, a major role. And what we said was, no, you are a weakened power. And all those parts of the Soviet Union that are now independent countries, the Baltics, you know, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, um, Georgia, Ukraine, Belarus, everything now, they're independent countries. Central Asia, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, etc. It's no longer the Soviet Union. And we said, you cannot control the lives of those countries either. So Russia had to define, what, you know, where does it fit in? And I think that is the problem. We never really did define it. And Russia felt that it was insulted and demeaned and ignored. So that is, I think, what we had. We took our eye off the ball. I remember, I'll tell you, you know, I was in Moscow as a bureau chief from um, 1997 and, uh, to uh, 2006, but I was going there a lot in the 80s and the 90s. And I remember thinking in the early 90s, maybe I would have just give up on Russia studies and my expertise because, you know what, it's just going to become another boring country. It's going to be Belgium, you know? <laughs> no, no. It's never going to be Belgium. Russia is never going to be a small European country. It thinks it is big. And it's right. It's influential. And I think always will be. So we took our eye off the ball thinking they don't really matter. Yeah, they had some nukes, but they were doing agreements for nukes. And the Russians were kind of sitting there thinking, hmm. They're ignoring us. When we're strong again, we'll show them. And I think that that is what Putin is doing. I think he's saying, in fact, he literally has said that. In a speech, that March speech, he said, um, you didn't pay attention then, pay attention now. That's a quote. Pay attention now. So that's the way he looks at it. So we have time for one more question. And there are a couple questions here about the and yeah. sort of the future of, of you. Uh, 
Um, do young people hope to leave Russia? Um, do you see the youth in Russia supporting Putin as a leader, or how likely is it that Putin will, um, uh, that, that youth will find their aspirations under Putin, um, or that, or that uh, Putin would find power among Russian youth in order to, to He's trying to. I mean, the Kremlin during this election did a lot of outreach to young people, and they've created another youth organization. They used to have uh, an organization that existed, which was called Nashi. And Nashi really doesn't exist anymore. There's another one that's kind of similar. And they try to invite youth. They can come, you know, young kids can come. They can um, invent apps uh, on very nice computers. They have a beautiful building in downtown Moscow. They're, they're concerned about the young people, and I think rightly so. So those young people, I don't think they want to leave. I think Russians, you know, there's a real draw, I think, among many Russians at any age, a draw culturally and, and their affinity for Russia, you know, the culture, the language. Russians like Russia. It's their country. It's very, it has a real appeal. So I don't think people always willingly go. Usually, you know, there's either people, you know, have to go because they're suffering persecution, or they feel that it's better and they can't, um, they can be, they can have a better life in another country. But the people in uh, those tens of thousands in Silicon Valley are not necessarily becoming Americans. A lot of them are still Russians. So they have an idea that maybe they will go back. Not everybody, but a number of them told me they want to go back. But when is the question? Because they know that right now they can't do in Russia what they're doing in South So I think that's part of it. There is a brain drain. Uh, Putin is trying to turn that around. Um, ever since the poisoning of Skripal, there's now, uh, they are urging people, the oligarchs, to take their kids back to Russia. Take them out of those London schools. Take them, you know, those snazzy you know, London schools. Take them back to Russia. And they've started a new, this a new institution, like a university, that they're actually trying to start to attract. It will be really sophisticated and really nice and uh, trying to attract young people back. But I think the, um, I remember, I'll give you this and kind of end on this. In the, the summer, I think it was August of last year, I was in Moscow, and there were protest demonstrations against Putin and the government. So it, it, it was called by Mr. Devine, the, you know, Alexander Devine. So there are thousands of people on the streets, the main drag in Moscow, we um, were looking for a place to get a big wide shot, and this is a CNN crew. So I saw these people up on a balcony on one of the buildings, and I said, hey, can we come up? And they said, yeah, yeah, come on. So we go up the stairs, and it turns out it's one of these kind of like um, offices where you can rent the office space for like an hour or two that we have. And it is a coffee bar, and you know, they're drinking espresso, and it was a very cool, really nice space, kind of like something you'd see in Seattle. And so the crew is taking pictures, and I go over to the window, and I'm looking down at all these people, and one of the young people, uh, the young guys, comes in, he, he's probably like maximum 18, and he's standing there, and at that very moment, these kids who have signs, like Putin, get lost signs, but they also, at that moment, they start singing the Russian national anthem. And I thought, that is really amazing. And so this young kid is standing next to the window. We're the only ones in this room. I'm at the window looking over, and this young kid, I'm sure ignoring me completely, is looking out the window, and he begins to sing the Russian national anthem. And it really almost, you know, brings tears to my eyes, because this kid is not, he is, he wants a future, and he wants a future in Russia. But he, so he's proud of Russia. 
He doesn't, I'm sure, I never talked to him, I never asked anything, but he's standing there singing the national anthem. And I found it very moving, obviously. So what is, you know, what is going on in his mind? And the only way I can put it together is that he wants a different Russia. You know, he wants a more modern, progressive, um, you know, entrepreneurial country where he can do what he wants to do with his life, which will be free of bureaucratic government control, will be free of the old guys who are running the country with an enormous amount of corruption. And he wants to be like everybody else in the world. He wants a chance, and he wants to be respected. This is what I take away from that. So I think that's, this generation, remember, they know nobody but Putin. For, you know, this kid is 18. Putin's been in power for 18 years. So they have known nobody but him. So they owe, they owe some of their good life to Putin. Because Putin actually did, in his early days, improve the economy, massively improve the economy. And so they're living the good life. And they have computers, and they have you know, iPhones, and they have everything because of that better life. But now they want something else. And I don't think Putin at this point really is quite capable of giving it to them. And it's undefined. But it is respect for them as a person. Very different from Russians, certainly, you know, in their 30s and 40s, and certainly my age. Um, but, but they are proud of Russia. One caveat, finally. They are proud of Russia. And so that pride in Russia can be turned by leaders who want to exploit that into nationalism. And that's where I think it gets dangerous. I'm depicting it as something that's very heartrending, and it is. You know, it is. It's very touching. But I think a, an unscrupulous leader could exploit that and turn it into nationalism. We see that in many countries. So, I you know it's dangerous because it's not, you know, it's in a lot of countries. So it can be exploited. And that's what I would be careful of. I would not insult Russia. I would try to work with them. Because once you start insulting them, it's going to backfire. And these young people, even like Putin himself, want respect. So I'll end on that. Um, thank you. Those were great questions. Thank you. Thank you very much.